Good evening. Thank you for braving the rain and coming out tonight. It's great to see everybody here. So I'm just going to begin with a little background. Um, this is now becoming something of a tradition, our uh, partnering with another organization to host and organize an exhibition featuring work by people from SVA uh, who have some kind of connection with that other institution's community. So last year, we partnered with uh, Museo del Barrio, and uh, this year with Skowhegan. I'm really grateful that Sarah Workna, the co-director of Skowhegan, uh, so warmly received my proposal, my suggestion that we work together, and it was just a, a fabulous collaboration. I want to give a shout out also to Allison Kuo, our program coordinator who organizes or co-organizes often in the background uh, all of our exhibitions, and also Francisco Di Tommaso, the director of SVA Galleries, uh, for being such a great partner. Um, so let me uh, introduce tonight's event. Tonight we're here to celebrate the launch of the exhibition catalog for SVA, how do we pronounce it? Times. Times, <laughs> SVA Times Skowhegan. <laughs> SVA X Skowhegan, we'll talk about it. Yeah. What's that? Per Skowhegan, right. And have a conversation with the curator, Lauren Haynes, and two artists from the exhibition, Mirjana Todorova and Marvin Touré. In August 2016, Lauren was appointed curator of contemporary art at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, before that, and since 2006, Lauren was associate curator of the permanent collection at the Studio Museum in Harlem. At the Studio Museum, she curated landmark exhibitions including Speaking of People, Ebony, Jet, and Contemporary Art, Stanley Whitney, Dance of the Orange, uh, a show that I saw and just absolutely loved. Thank you for that. Um, and Carrie Mae Weems, the museum series. Lauren received a BA in art history from Oberlin College in 2005 with a minor in African American studies. Mirjana Todorova, to my far left, her work questions the politics of public space and how people occupy it and combines painting, performance, video, and public interventions. Mariana's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally at venues and events, including Apex Art in New York, the Palisades Public Library in New Jersey, uh, Lumen, the video art festival in Staten Island in 2011, uh, Parlor No. 21 in Venice, uh, Pulse Art Fair in 2012, Node Center for Curatorial Studies in Berlin, and Brick uh, in Brooklyn. Brianna received a foundation degree from Central St. Martins in London, a BA in illustration and animation from Instituto Europeo di Design in Rome in 2006, a diploma in, she has a lot of degrees, a diploma in design and society actions on public space from Elisava, Escola Superior de Diseño in Barcelona, uh, a BFA in fine arts from SVA, and an MFA in fine arts from SVA. Wow. Uh, in 2012. She attended Skowhegan uh, in 2012, right after finishing SVA. Marvin Touré is an Ivorian American artist who engages with his heritage and his urban southern upbringing through his creative practice. His work has been presented at the Prism Art Fair and at Gateway Projects in New Jersey. And he has a, a few other things in the works that I'm not allowed to talk about yet. In 2014, Marvin uh, received a BA in New Media Arts with a minor in Architecture from Southern Polytechnic, uh, which is now Kennesaw State University Marietta Campus uh, in Georgia. And in 2016, just this last spring, he received an MFA in Fine Arts from the MFA Fine Arts program at SVA. He attended Skowhegan just this last summer. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Hayes, Hayes, Haynes, Mirjana Todorova, and Marvin Touré. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm gonna just be that person. Hold it. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Here we go. 
mainly so I can lean back. Um, thanks, Mark, for that amazing introduction. Thank you all so much for braving the New York weather. I get to say that now because I don't live here. I'm like, oh, it's so cold here. It's not that cold. Um, really excited to welcome Marvin, Mariana. Thank you guys so much for um, agreeing to participate in this with me. And just to give you guys a little bit of sort of um, overview of what we're gonna do. We're just gonna chat a little bit about the exhibition, about both your experiences at SVA and Skowhegan, and then definitely leave time for questions. So please make sure, if, you, if anything that we're saying rings true, please jot it down and we'll make sure to have some time for questions at the end, and then also some time for everyone to look around again and have another drink and spend some time in the show before we end at eight. So does that sound good? Um, so just to, I guess, start, maybe we can think about this idea of how Mark really read a bit about your works and your practice, and maybe we can just dive in to the works that are on view here. Um, luckily, the way that this is set up, we're in an amazing spot because we, your works surround us in a way at various corners. So Mirana, do you want to start and talk a little bit yeah, about sure. the work in the show, which is to sure our left? Just mic check. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, um, oh, maybe we're wrong. Sorry, guys. Um, so, the work that's included in the exhibition is um, these works that are along this wall. Um, they are four paintings, and um, they're about um, landscape and. Um, movable architecture and uh, this sort of altered geography um, that I think we were connecting um, on like when I was talking first to Lauren and she invited me to participate. And um, they are not works that I did directly in relation to SVA or to Skowhegan, but in a way they are very much uh, there in the thinking. Like uh, I think a lot of things came from um, being at Skowhegan um, in the woods in 2012 and also before that for a couple of years at SVA. Um, and I think it's partially this displacement and also this viewpoint that's altered and then um, allowing so many voices to come to you that sometimes are like filters and um, other times are just barriers that you are overcoming. Um, so when I was doing the works, it was also like thinking about the stuff that you're working through and you're almost every time so close to something that you desire or you believe in, but there's always something that you struggle with in order to get there. So I think they're about like viewing something from a point that it's so close to that point of being there, but it's still not there. So I think um, it has to do with, with topics that I'm also interested in in my work, which is social mobility and uh, the sort of construction of yourself and uh, expansion of the body. I'm interested in also creating this movable architecture idea that um, is allowing people to be more empowered, to move things as they go and not be so like obstructed and and stuck in structures. So those were some of the things that were related to the work. But in my own work in general, I make sculptures and videos and performances and paintings and a lot of other things. So the practice is sort of expanded and um, painting is only um, usually the beginning of everything else. A lot of ideas I generate through painting and then they become like covers or prototypes and then they travel to the world and enter in situations with social practice a lot. <laughs> what? Sorry. what was your work before 2012 and when you were in school, what was your work like? Was it sort of of a similar language and similar ideas or has there been a real progression for you in the, what you're thinking about and how the work has um, evolved, I guess, particularly over the last four years since you've had the experience at SVA and then Skowhegan? 
the work was always consistent in this interest of um, architecture and the body. Um, but I think the work started to relate to spaces more as I was traveling, and especially the last four years have been so um, difficult in just managing life and um, traveling so much. I've shown in Europe and here and constantly been on the go. And I think this idea of the artist that just travels and exists in so many places is really wonderful. But in a way, I think in my work, I try to bring a lot of the every day of this sort of awkwardness of how we have to manage all these different realities. So um, I think the work in the last year, um, especially, has be returned more to painting. And after Skowhegan and during SVA as well, and during Skowhegan, I did a lot of performative work. Um, also at Skowhegan, I was doing frescoes, which were sort of returning to my um, family because my grandfather was a fresco painter in Bulgaria. So um, I think Skowhegan was a place where I really like came back to where I came from. And I think SVA was a place where um, it helped me to get introduced to New York and to the world in general and to become so so much more confident as an artist of what I'm really going for. At, at Skowhegan, everything sort of broke down and became like, where are we and what are we doing? And does it matter when you're in the middle of nowhere and not related to your peers? And what does your work mean if it's about public space, but then you are in nature and vice versa? So at Skowhegan, I made these frescoes that were a lot about nature and landscape. And in my other work, it's so much about architecture. So these last paintings in the last years were like a clash of both. <laughs> So. No, I, I think that comes across, and I feel like that's a, one of the things that I was drawn to in thinking about the exhibition and thinking about how to bring together these two amazing organizations that have worked with such a fantastic range of artists, really, and thinking about the exhibition and wondering, OK, been, being given this artist list that was pages long, which was you know, a great an exercise, I think, for any curator to be given the task of saying, okay, here are the artists. Some I knew, some I didn't, and really being able to dig in and look at websites and start thinking to colleagues in the field also who I knew had relationships with some of the artists and really thinking about, okay, how do we, how do I think about this in a way that brings together these two places without it just sort of feeling like, oh, Coincidentally, here's a grab bag full of artists, and here are the five that I picked out, here are six that I picked out, but really wanting to give a focus. So first I decided to narrow it down a little and thinking about, okay, what a, does it mean to look at alums from both programs and a few faculty from 2000 to 2016? And then really what does it mean to think about and engage with artists who are in their own variety of ways thinking about this idea of landscape or place or geography particularly now as we're in you know, our society that is very global and very much people are living and working and being able to think about, well, how do I make work here? How do I make work in Europe? How do I show work at all these places that really speaks to what I'm doing? So that's really part of what jumped out at me when I was thinking about your work as well and just really being excited by that idea. Um, Marvin. No, your turn. Um, and I, you, it was also, you know, as I mentioned, the list long, but really being excited about this idea of including a very recent alum. So someone who at the time had probably just gotten back in this after the summer at Skowhegan and just really also excited about this idea of an installation and doing something site specific. So can you talk to us a little bit about your work in general and then the work that we have on view here? Um, so. So I guess I have a question first for the audience. Like how many of you have ever made like a mind map? Like raise your, like a show of hands. Okay. Um, what is that? A mind map, okay. Ooh. I'm, I'm gonna get to it, I'm gonna get to it. Um, what about um, taking notes, anybody? Well, anybody who's in Mark's program, you should have taken some kind of notes, like raise hands, hands? Okay, all right, so pretty much um, the reason why I did that little exercise was just to, what I was doing was, in a way, trying to do this um, exercise in cognitive mapping. So I'm like mapping out my ideas um, in 
and mapping out like my mind state. So in this idea of landscape and uh, in the, I guess, conversation of this exhibition, I was thinking about the landscape, like my mental landscape, like psychologically well, like where I'm at at the time. And anybody who's been to Skowhegan knows that you're kind of discombobulated after you come back. So um, it's a little disheveled and, it's kind of loud, um, it's a little disheveled and, and all of these different ideas and different emotions and things kind of come together and you're trying to like put yourself back together. So in a way of, um, seeing yourself as a puzzle and you in a way being dissolved and then you trying to you know pick up the pieces and then figure out like what that means so and um my practice in general so um as of late um <clears throat> so uh, i'm kind of looking at this idea between the like me as a as a black male as an like, ivorian american artist like this idea of like um this space I hold in the American consciousness of kind of oscillating between uh, quasi and superhuman. Um, so that's why I kind of like, if you look, there's like superheroes and you know cartoons and stuff in, in my work because I kind of look at this idea of what does it mean to be viewed as, as not human, as less than human, but then what is it to be fetishized as having superhuman abilities? Um, so these are kinds of like the ideas that I toy with in the work and I use it, I um, use games and, you know, comic book imagery and cartoons to kind of like suss that out. You both touched on this a little bit, but I'm gonna push it. I want to know. I want to know more. You both are talk talking about the experience of being in Maine at Skowhegan and Marvin. You're saying coming back feeling a little discombobulated. And I know before we were chatting about it a little bit. Can you guys talk about what, how that experience, um, sort of now as you're looking back and thinking about it, what that means? I think everybody who goes there comes back and tries to, like, the next five years, figure out what happened. But um, it's a lot of things. I think it's the fact that you are isolated first, then you are, like, with these amazing people. So the world becomes, like, this um, great place. Like, you love everybody around. You are inspired by them, and you believe in them. And um, uh, suddenly, all these, like, social propositions that you were imagining that could happen suddenly are happening in front of your eyes. So everybody is doing these things that you can be part of. Everything is fluid. People merge. Conversation is so much more open. Uh, people share ideas on different levels. So these are the strengths, I think, of Skowhegan being there. And um, I think coming back is always rough because suddenly you are in you, you come to New York and then you're like, who are these people? I, 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 you know, you're used to be being with like 65 people or 100, including staff that, you know, you know and you feel related to. And suddenly in the city, you feel like, oh, there's so much going on that I don't know what to do. Like, I'm almost like not in control. I don't know how to act. I don't know how to connect to so many people. People don't have time. So there is this factor, and there is also the other thing of like being in such a condensed time, facing so many of your phobias and problems and issues, and and facing who you are and changing yourself, and then coming back and realizing, oh, I change, but then what do I do now with my life? You know. So I think that's part of my experience was that in grad school, especially at SVA, um, it was so much about community in a way of um, really sharing, exchanging, and getting your art to the next level and pushing everything and showing as much as you can, getting the opportunities that you could and um, being so out there. Then at Skowhegan, especially in my case, straight after, then you go there and then you're like, oh, what does it mean to have a career? Where am I in my career? And all these things start to like feel um, like difficult. Like, okay, I got into a place where maybe I'm an emerging artist or some of some sort or something. But then what do I do to help this world to move forward? Like who, you know, who do I relate to and who do who who do I want to make work with? Then you come back and you know, community you start picking places where you live, where you're gonna work, and um it's really I think it's difficult. You lose yourself in the city so easily and um you that's why after Skowhegan you need to meet again and again and 
um, gather with all the people that have been to Skowhegan because they, they feel like they, they are at, this, at that level, that they understand you. And that helps. Sarah knows we've gathered like many, many times after and we crying and stuff because you feel like your family left you or something like that, you know, <laughs> or you abandoned something that you didn't want to and, you know, or you were forced. But at the same time, you don't want to really re return to it because it's like a capsule and time lapse and it's so special and you feel like you can't reconstruct it if you don't have the same timeline. So, so coming back to it is not good and, <laughs> and actually reinventing it, it's the only way perhaps. So you try to create all these initiatives and exhibitions and people um, do shows and um, performances and projects together. And I think it's in that sort of search of how can we make at least these fragments of of what we had there happen again, and maybe that could build up to something. And I think with SVA is the same thing. I, I returned to SVA in order to find these people that are interested, and they're not just competitive and pushing you in order to get to the next thing, but um, they're really wanting to expand um, their vision. And they're questioning, and they're, you know, they're at every stage thinking and reconsidering. And um, I think it's hard for all of us to sort of um, live, especially in New York, you know, when you are so pressed for time. But I think we've got to find these like time, time capsules where we are together and we are, you know, intensely together. I think it happens at Cowhegan, it happens at the MFA, at, at, at SVA. I mean, I, w I had such a strong connection with all the pe people I graduated with, and it was because of the time we spent together, and madness was possible, and we could do anything, and everything was like, oh, we could just do this, you know? Even though, okay, time was ticking, you know? <laughs> the clock was ticking, it was May coming in, and SVA was like, oh, you've got to get out. <laughs> yeah. No, it definitely seems as if this idea of community and how you find the community at both places and keep it seems to be something I think that both of you talk about and have been interested in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in my experience, it's just a matter of like at school, you're so it's so deadline oriented where it's like, okay, well, I need I have a paper, I got to do artist statement, I need to have this project done before this review, before this person comes into my studio. But at Skowhegan, it's like it slows you down. Um, completely, you're just literally out there in the woods and you get time to really reflect and to hear yourself. Because sometimes in the city it's so noisy that you can't, you can't hear yourself. Like even, I didn't even realize like how much um, something as simple as like my cell phone was noise. It's still noise, it's like visual noise. It's like, and how that can be distracting to my creative practice. So to think about um, me actually sitting down in this kind of barn style studio and just really like listening to the wind and and having people come into my studio or even just walking down a trail and talking to somebody, like stopping in the middle of the trail and talking to somebody for four hours about like anything from, I don't know, um, hip hop to, you know, I don't know, like what we're gonna eat at the dining hall or whatever. But it's like, it's, it's deep, intense conversations and I think they all in a way get you to really think about your practice differently. Yeah. And I think for me, it was about this idea of this intense emotion and putting that, I guess, imbuing that into the work and why. Like, where is that coming from? And uh, to suss out the source of like that creative juice, you know, because in school, sometimes you're going so fast, you can't really like think about like, wh why do I even make work in the first place? Like, why do I care about this? You know, like, why would I go to, why would I go to the store by canvas or stretch canvas or why am I drawing squiggly marks on a piece of paper? Like, it doesn't, in the broader scheme of things, like, it doesn't make sense. Like, why am I doing this? And I think Escalhina gives you time to really, you know, confront yourself with that question. Like, if, like, are you, um, you know, is this something that you uh, really care about and why do you care about it? You know, if you're only focused in um, line and form, if that's like your only thing and you're trying to discover that in like string or whatever, like it's that idea of I understand why I like 
this string. Like, you know, or I understand why I like the color blue or I like black. Like, you know, it's like I understand why I'm drawn. I have these natural urges to these mediums and these like, um, and these ideas that I'm discovering. Um, so I think that coming back to the city, it's about bringing that time, like, like how you got to that quiet back into your life now. And I think that, you know, I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna take like five years. Like that's a lot. Like five. Like that's to to dissect it for. I hope so. But I mean, um, as of right now, the way I'm looking at it is that I'm still kind of, you know, it's intense emotions that you're going through, and I'm still kind of getting through it. But I think that the most important um, aspect for me was to you know get confronted with myself. And you, you see your reflection in everything. You see your reflection in the leaves and the wind and the sounds of the birds. You see your reflection in the grass, in the gravel, in the, 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 the lake. Like, it's like you're looking at yourself and constantly being confronted with like, why you create. And I don't think a lot of people outside of that environment like, question that or even have a drive to even ask that question. Because like, you're too busy trying to pay rent. Who's going to sit down and think about, like, oh, like, why do I like the color blue? Like, yo. Like, no, nobody has time to think about that. So it's like, you know, to, it's really a great place to think, to sit down and just like, you know, reflect. So. Yeah. I feel like that's an important point that you're making, that sometimes being in the city and being in the art world and being artists and art students, there's a lot of pressure on sort of the next thing and what you need to do and how you have to keep going, but really being able to take advantages of places like Skowhegan and residencies that give you a moment to reflect and think about it and come back to the work while you're doing it, I think is really important. Can you all talk to me a little bit about how the work, if maybe it hasn't, but how your work that's in this exhibition has changed for you seeing it in this context or now, you know, I know you both were at the opening, um, in December and now even a month later coming and seeing it again and really thinking about how that feels. Particularly, Marvin, your work is site specific, so this is the first time that you've installed it and seen it, not just on the drawing that you made and while you were installing it, and now how it feels to you. I think um, in terms of, well, I think I'm gonna answer it this way. In terms of uh, like how my work, I guess, has changed since, um, you know, from, uh, school till now. I think that for me, I don't know, like I had an interesting, a couple of really great studio visits. And I remember one towards the end with uh, Craig Drennan. He was one of the um, the deans uh, this past summer. He's like awesome. And like he, he told me about this idea of your critical mechanism. Like when you're thinking about your work, your critical mechanism being like, like overpowering your ability to actually create something meaningful. So sometimes we get so caught up in theories and that we, you know, theory and these kind of deep um, questions of uh, that, you know, you know, of our history and things of that nature that we forget to think about, you know, that um, like emotion and intuition and feeling and what and what drives your practice in that way. So I keep going back to the idea of like that emotion driving the practice because I think that that's that that element of the work that you can't really explain, you know, that you can't. Um, really put down sometimes in a you know 500 word you know or a statement or like a you know for a grant or whatever like you can't at times like it's okay to have a part of your practice that you can't explain that you can't write that you can't necessarily put into words at a point because you know I think at times that's where the magic lies you know and I think when at times when you're in in certain kinds of institutions and there's like a pressure to you know, kind of, you know, package your work in a way, um, you get to a point where you forget that magic and you forget what that extra thing is that um, wakes you up in the morning. You know, um, also had a, you know, another great studio visit with uh, Robert Gober and he was just like, you know, when you find out what, you know, that thing is that wakes you up in the morning, you have to protect it. Yeah. So that's something that I've constantly, I guess, these ideas have been constantly been thinking about. Um, this idea of like this kind of emotive quality of the work and you know what that means. So I think that's something uh, that I, that has changed because my work before was a lot was a lot of a lot of head a lot of head you know and you know I think I got to a point like after the summer where um, 
I'm really starting to let like the magic back in. Like something, like if there's a voice I can't really explain, like I don't wanna demystify my practice too much that I can like, that I don't know whatever that specter is that like f at four in the morning, that's like whatever that spirit is that's like speaking to me to think, to make, to you know, make that gesture or rip this up or you know, throw that out, whatever that is, um, I don't wanna name it just because I don't want it to leave. You know, because I feel like sometimes when you get too caught up in trying to put it down, um, you end up losing the magic and then you just become formulaic and, you know, yeah. yeah. So I think that's the most, the biggest change for me was to, you know, get that, like, that gold mm -hmm. back in the work. Back to the show a little bit. So <clears throat> I, I kind of knew a lot of the people in the show. First with Alejandro Guzman, we were in the same year at Skowhegan. Greg, I, um, I knew him out of SVA. He was two years ahead of me. We were best friends. Sharona was one of my best friends who was behind. So um, I kind of, you know, from you describing the show and knowing who's in the show, I sort of kind of started to create this um, you know, idea about what I'm gonna see and knowing the work of the people that, you know, and especially Fred and uh, Tommy and all the, um, all our faculty from SBA, um, you know, sort of, they were the people that I would look up to and like follow their work a lot. So I felt like I had a pretty good understanding of what's going on and also you mentioned geography and identity and, you know, there were these things that I kind of like, you know, they they made sense, and then it was interesting when I when I came to see the show a couple of weeks later. Like I was kind of surprised because, in a way, like everything did make sense and also didn't. So it was a little bit of a. Um, I think that's that's where I feel like it's the the strongest point in the show is that. Not, nothing is as you know it in a way like everything gets like uh, transformed because of context or because of where you are or you know um so yeah with with Sharona's work I um I I really love her paintings but I suddenly like her being next to mine I felt like oh my god <laughs> we're really like related and I never felt so, you know, before, but I guess even in terms of color and the way we were thinking about all these layers of perception and optics and looking through spaces, through another spaces and this sort of altered vision. And I feel like also having Ulrike's work, um, like um, I, I felt suddenly so um, related to them as well. And uh, they made me feel like, um, that they possess something that I'm also pursuing in my work. Even though I'm making different kind of work, it's like this intensity to the moment and the detail and seeing something so so well, but it's also so far. And um, I really love the installation of Tommy and, you know, and um, also that work. Like, really, I really connect to and um, um, I'm inspired by. So the show became like the sort of contradiction be between what you know and what you don't. With Alejandro's work as well, we did performances together when we were back at SVA and it was like seeing like again like these sort of structures and rem remembering also what he did at, S at um, SVA and at Skowhegan too. It felt different. I think it's also time removes these layers of how you understand the work. I remember having like studio visits with these people, especially with Sharona and with Alejandro, and feeling like I know what I'm talking about. I have an opinion about the work, but then we don't talk to each other for for a few years, and I feel like I don't know anymore. You know, so I think it's also that element of knowledge and how much you apply to the work, like, and you're judging it before you even seeing it. So, I think the show was refreshing in a way that okay, now I'm like confronted with work that I could see it fresh eyes, even though I know where it comes from, but still, like it surprises me. So, so I love that about the show and I'm glad that it happened. So. Cool. Um, I think we should open it up for questions from the audience. I also wanna give you all an opportunity if you guys have questions for each other. Um, 
or even for me, um, let me know. But anyone have a question? There's a microphone, so I think it's this one. So uh, my question is for Marvin. Um, when you're in the city, I'm sure you're faced with issues of politics and race, masculinity. But when you go away and uh, or it's Gohegan, how does that change when you're not confronted with it on a daily basis? You talked a little bit about the waking up and sometimes the magic's not there. Is that because uh, some of the tensions were not so uh, in front of you. So how did that change your work, uh, dealing with these issues when you're not uh, in, the, in the tension of a city? I mean, I think that, see, I grew up in Georgia, so it's not just about the tension being you know, here. It's kind of everywhere. You know, people bring that with them wherever they go. So um, whether you're in, I don't know, in New York or doing a residency on the moon, if you have people that are um, that were that are part of these you know civilizations that we're from that are part of these communities they're going to bring their own you know baggage to these places so you can't really escape that there's no perfect like you know kind of space but the good thing is is when you have institutions that try to like you know that have the right, the correct instincts in going against some some of the things when you get that pushback, I think is a, is important. Um, but to answer your question, I think that uh, I'm always kind of faced with that. Like I never can get, I guess, away from it unless I'm in, like you're in your own home in a way and you just gotta like shut off, you know. Uh, and, you know, I believe it was like Bell Hooks who talks about like your home being like a pace of like revolution and being in a pace of like reprieve and stuff like that. So I think that like um, that's a place where, you know, you can kind of get that magic back, you know, kind of get that away, um, away from all of that noise, you know, to kind of hear yourself, you know? I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Hello, I can't see you. Hi, everyone. Um, I had a quick question for you guys. Um, I hear a lot of talk about the epiphanies that you had or the realizations during this program. Was it facilitated by the program itself, the people that were you were involved with, um, the teachers, your peers, or was it more of a byproduct just being in a place? Um, I know, Marvin, you talked about that a little bit, but um, what was more, what was more of um, the facilitator of those that awakening, I would say. Of the awakening, I think it's um. I don't know. I think it's a it's a combination of everything of just the artist that you're surrounded with, like how your mind works, and then also like being in that space. I think it just like creates this weird perfect equation of that's gonna kind of push you to get to those points that you know another environment wouldn't um, have as intensive. Uh, factors to push you to get there. I don't know, that makes I would say um, it's, it's of course the people most of the time. Um, for me, it's been uh, the people that you can work with or you're, you're surrounded by. Our group in 2012 at Skowhegan was, was amazing. We just like everybody wanted to collaborate so much between each other and Every day there will be a performance somewhere that somebody sh or you know somebody is shooting a film and do you want to be a cast? Do you want to make this? Do you want to make that? Stages in front of the field and um, you know people going on a boat in the in the lake and shooting something. You were always part of something, so I think that was the most valuable to me. And I think in the city ever since, I actually I I could say that to SVA too. I mean. I was sort of claimed to be this teaser of everybody and trying to push everybody to do sh <laughs> to do shit and um, thing you know people were sometimes mad because I would you know I would want people to be active and they would be like not always people have to do so many things um, but I always feel like if you're in a place with other people you know um, okay you can close yourself off and 
be theirs as well. But I think the most valuable thing is to try to do something with them and to understand them. So um, that happened at SBA too. I collaborated with a lot of people. Most of my performative projects were collaborative. So there were performances on the street, people coming to do something or shooting or helping me. So I think that happened in both SBA and Skowhegan. The most was like this participation that did not have to always equate money, did not have to always equate exact time. And uh, it's hard. It's hard because then things get messy. You don't know how to define them. And then after that, there's this product or a project or an artwork, and you don't know how to share it. You don't know of its existence. That happens a lot with my work, that you know, when it's performative and collaborative and open to participation, then you know, then the project travels and becomes part of other work, and then, you know, it's hard to define sometimes the authorities and who is supposed to, you know, continue to take care of the work. But I think the most important for me is, like, really the people and how you negotiate with them to create these situations. At Skowhegan was a little bit easier because people had time. In the city was a little bit tougher because, um, you know, it was just tougher. But then my work is again, like, uh, I'm interested in public space, so I love making work in the city because there is a reality out there on top of another reality, on top of the everyday. And um, so much to, yeah, as you said, re reacts against. You have these tensions, uh, whether in nature, uh, you know, you're a little bit more on your own. so. You have to create everything kind of out of scratch. Um, I hope that answers. Other questions? Um, yeah. Whoa, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> I can speak on this. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, my name is Michael Anthony Pigas. Uh, I'm an artist, pop artist. Um, my first time coming, I've heard about SVA, and uh, this is quite interesting. Um, I do understand that there's a different uh, diversities in here, and uh, just hearing from all you people up there, um, this is quite understandable um, that you um, have to uh, keep uh, things moving. Uh, in the art world, and uh, regardless of whatever distraction, anything like that, anything that distracts me or whatever, I, it doesn't. I just keep going. You know, it don't matter um, as long as something comes out of your head. But um, this is really uh, interesting uh, to see that artists, young people, are still you know uh, uh, um, prospering and uh, as prolific as much. This looks very prolific in here, by the way. You know, there's a lot you know stuff I can see behind this, and. Uh, I'm just glad to be here and uh, just um, quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lauren, I just I had a question for you, which is, I mean, since when you talked about the process of finding a curatorial theme for the show and how it's thinking about artists and how they're constantly being asked to move and, um, you know, wanting to be in different places, but also maybe out of necessity. Um, I was I just was wondering how that might have resonated for you since you were living in two cities at once while you were curating, curating the show and you know making that transition. Yeah, I think, you know, for me I I am learning and I feel like everyone will need to learn this, that how how do you use your time and think about, you know, all the things that you get asked to do and really prioritize what you say yes to. So really in thinking about how this all came about and when Sarah reached out and was like, of course I want to do this, I think part of my brain should have been like, wait, can you actually do this? And it, I think it did because I realized that this was such an exciting opportunity for me because being, I was at the Studio Museum for almost 10 years in the Studio Museum for those of you who don't know, is a museum on 125th Street between Lenox and Adam Clayton Powell that for almost 50 years has been really at the forefront of this idea of artists of African descent. There's an amazing residency program and really it's been a space for a lot of artists who to get their start and to really be able to 
express ideas. And so working with a very particular set of artists, black artists mostly, or artists who are thinking about ideas around black culture for 10 years, and then being able to, about to transition into an institution that is focused on American art and all the ways and what that means, really excited by the opportunity that I was given with this exhibition to think about artists across the board. So really being able to dig in and think of this list and do some interesting ideas of how do you make connections for artists and what am I thinking about and what's exciting to me and what is gonna sort of keep me excited about this project that's happening at a time where, you know, I think I had a few studio visits with people and then I'm pretty sure I probably told everyone, so we can Skype because I'm moving in like two days um, or I'll be back in a week and we can, so really also thankful for all the artists who were very flexible and you know, the teams at SVA and at Skowhegan who are really working with me to make this happen. So I think it was an exciting exercise in that way for me and it was also just honestly really a way to stay connected to New York and to this institution and to really be able to know that okay, I'm gonna have these moments to come back and to engage with a whole new set of artists and to really be excited about what I can bring from this experience to my new job and to really think about how do I continue this conversation with all these artists in a new context was something that I hope to um, take away from this. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, say what? Welcome to the art world. Right. Welcome to the art world, everybody. Um, so Marvin, when you came back from Skowhegan, you know, I said, how was it? You said, changed my life. And I think um, you gave a bit of a clue as to how, when you talked about it giving you time and space to reflect on why, why you make art, why dedicate your life to something like so difficult, um, something that's so often unappreciated or thinly rewarded. You know, there's lots of professions and avocations that don't really demand an answer to that question. You know, a lot of people do what they do because it's the only option open to them or for the money or for the, you know, whatever. Um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think it, so I often ask my students, you all know, I ask why, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why do we do this? Um, and there's, in my mind, there's two sets, two ways of answering the question. And what I, the first set of answers usually have something to do with why you do it for yourself. Um, it's what I enjoy most, it's what I'm best at, it's the only thing I've ever really been good at. And those, and then there's, I feel like we need to dig deeper and that's maybe what you were doing up on the lake in Maine, there's an answer that has to do, why do I do this beyond just self, more self-centered reasons? Like, you know, why is this the most important thing I can do with this one life that I have? Or this life that I have now, if you believe in multiple lives. Um, so did you come up with an answer? <laughs> wow. For um, the two artists on the panel and maybe also um, for the curator? I mean, I think that, wow. Uh, I think that answer became apparent to me after I left Skowhegan in my travels, because after I left Skowhegan, um, I went to uh, travel to um, Paris, and then I went to the Ivory Coast for the first time. So um, this is a place where my whole family's from. Like, I have never been there. So I got there, and um, so we were in the city and going around and whatever, and then me, my father, myself, and my uncle took a road trip um, to the village where my dad um, was from. And, you know, I'm sitting there, it's like sitting with the elders and stuff like that. It's like real cool. I was like, oh. Um, and my dad's like telling them that, because uh, they're asking, oh, what does he do? He's a finished college, what he's doing. And my dad's like, oh, he's an artist. And, um, and like, I'm trying to explain to them what that means, because they're like, Art, so you, like will paint like walls and stuff. Like I was like, uh, not quite, but like so. Um, so in explaining to them that my dad was like, well, he talks about uh, you know things of 
you know, our people, you know, he puts like the words of our people in it. And like, you see the faces of these like elderly people like light up and they're just like, you talk about like our st stuff in like our dialect over there in America. I'm like, yeah, this is like, because it's of me. And like, I've never really seen that kind of level of joy from somebody just talking to them about my work before. And it's like, and I was like, this is, kind of, this was what I was searching for when I was in Scout This was kind of like the, that was like the period at the end of the sentence. I kind of fit, felt like I formulated like a SVA, like I came up with a couple of words, like at Scout Hegan, I finished, you know, the rest of that, that phrase. But then at the, when I got to, when I went back home, like I put the period on the sentence and I was like, okay, now I know, like now I realize like what that means to me. You know, it's just to, you know, to go back home to Atlanta and also to like, have friends of mine who I grew up with or whatever, like, you know, my bros, like, say, oh, um, I saw that piece you did, you know, it really meant a lot to me. That's, that means, you know, a great deal, more than any kind of write-up, you know, any, uh, you know, kind of show, it, just, it means a lot to speak, to be able to, like, speak to them in a language that uh, they understand. And, um, yeah, that, I think that's, that's what that, you know, what I've kind of found out for myself. For me, it was a little bit reversed. Um, Mark, you said like, oh, you go and you're there and then suddenly you're like more confronted with the question why I do this in general, also for other people and not just for myself. I think for me, it was more like, wow, before that, I was in the city, I would, you know, I was mostly concerned with the social, with like, why I do this, you know, in this world, what can I do for, for the people that I care for and for the things that I care for and how can I fight that and, and how, that, how can it let it in my work to be stronger and to empower other people as well. Then it's Cohegan, I was like, oh, where are these other people? They're not here. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, um, you know, everybody was an artist and was in a way indulging in their own pleasures and wanting to do this or that. And suddenly I felt like more liberated in a sense of thinking more who I am, you know, like then, like, why do I do this in the first place? And, you know, is this what I really love doing? And if I'm alone, at an island, you know, somewhere, it, w w what is it that I'm gonna be doing? W would I be painting or would I be drawing or would I be making structures? So for me it was a little bit the reverse, but the same conversation as Marvin said, it's like, it makes you relate to your inner voice of, you know, uh, as an artist, we have many voices, of course, in our head, but there is this one that it's very strong and it comes from the way you come from and, how you are raised and what you care for the most. And I think when you have access to that voice more and then you bring it in the work, it's, it's really good. And it, it feels like you're on the right track. But often, like, I feel like that voice is also, um, you know, I feel like it's too self-indulgent maybe. I mean, maybe because I'm from Bulgaria and we, uh, in my country, we are so much more concerned with the social. I mean, we've also been like, um, you know, under communism for so many years. So even when I was growing up, like there wasn't such thing as like you do this because you love it. Like when I came, first came to New York, it was like, oh, I love this, I love this, I love this. That's what I will hear a lot around. I love doing this. Back in my country, it was a lot about like, what does this mean? Like, who do you want to do this for? And you know, so I think for me, it was a little bit reversed also this idea of, doing art in America, you know, all these years. I mean, I've been like the last 10 years here and I'm still coming to terms with this thing of the individual. Like, <laughs> you know, in my country back then when I was growing up, the individual was like just someone. But it's the idea, the social idea together and constructing something that was like people would live for. And then the individual pleasures was like, oh, oh, forget about that. And that doesn't matter, you know, it's like, what, you know, the future, the utopian, the we all gonna build something. I mean, maybe that didn't happen, but you know, people were aiming for. So 
so I'm I'm loving the moment now where in America there's like this for you um, and maybe you feel differently but for me it's like I'm starting to feel like I'm back in Bulgaria where all these people are starting to be so active around me so I'm starting to feel like okay maybe it's it's there isn't separation it's just going back between the individual and the and the shared so a follow up for you Lauren does the answer to that question, is that important to you as part of your curatorial process, or is it about the work? I mean, the answer to that question, of course, is, is deeply rooted in, has to do with where the work comes from, right? But is the answer to that question important for you as a curator? Absolutely. I mean, I think what I, I sometimes go back and forth when I think about what my favorite part of my job is as a curator, but really it comes down to the conversation, particularly a contemporary art curator, it comes down to the conversations that I get to have with living artists. And to be able to talk to an artist and you can see someone's work and be drawn to it and want to know more, but if when you start that conversation, there's really nothing behind it besides, oh, I, I made this and there's no sort of reason that an artist can give about how or why or what really connects them to the work or why they make work and what the goal is, then it's hard to stay excited. At least for me, it's hard for me to stay really excited about this person's work and to want to invest time and you know whatever opportunity I can give in the conversation with someone. So really being able to, and there's no, you know what, there's no, I guess, it's not as if I want someone to have a particular answer to that question because I really want it to be true to themselves and their practice and the work, but I think at least being able to think about it is something that's important um, and helps me to be able to also formulate my thinking around what I do as a curator and what I can do and why I do what I do. Anybody have any last thoughts? All right, thank you so much. Oh. Okay, Mariana. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> One more question for Lauren. Um, I forgot to ask you in the first place, but... Uh, do you think in, at your new position, or probably it was already at the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, you, you know, if you're given the opportunity to start your own show, to curate something out of scratch, and you're, there are no other obligations or um, you know, other people imposing ideas, um, do you think you start from the work or, um, or from your experience or from ideas or how has it been, like, you know, at least for the last years? So all of those things, <laughs> if it makes sense in a way, I think there are some ways that you start from the, I start from the work, right? So always seeing and going to things and people sending me images and having studio visits and starting from the work in that way and seeing if there are things that people are, a lot of artists are thinking about or common themes that I see. Sometimes it starts from an idea that I have that I've been thinking about for a long time and I've finally found a way to articulate it through works of art. And then sometimes it starts with, there's an artist who I'm obsessed with and I just feel like, oh, now if I do this exhibition, they have to spend time with me and I get to understand the work and get to really do it. So it's really a variety of all of those things that happen and hopefully that's what it was like at the Studio Museum and hopefully, and that's what it will be like as I continue my curatorial practice sort of wherever I am. But do you think you're gonna have more of that where, you're, <laughs> where, you, <laughs> where you are now or do you think it's gonna be a lot of trying to work things out <laughs> in the field of... <laughs> Ooh, I see what you mean, like so trying to solve bigger, bigger, bigger issues that... Um, you know, that's a great question. I think there will be ideas that I'm just drawn to and that maybe won't solve or further any larger questions that we sort of think about as in, in the art world, but hopefully I will also be able to make exhibitions and work with artists that contribute to that conversation, even though being not in New York is sometimes, I think will be interesting to see sort of how that happens and sort of what, um, how I enter into various conversations being somewhere that's a little, um, off and below center. Um, so it's an exciting challenge, but I hopefully the work, my work as a curator won't change too much, I think. Thank you all. <laughs>